Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today. My name is Kelsey Prihoda, and I am the Great Lakes Transportation Extension Educator with Minnesota Sea Grant, which is the lead organization of the Hazardous Material Transport Outreach Network, or HAZMATON. Our network is a binational collaborative of specialists from the Great Lakes, Lake Champlain, and Hudson River as well as the St. Lawrence River regions, focused on reducing risks associated with multiple modes of oil and other hazardous material transportation. Hazmaton is committed to the dissemination of accurate, neutral, and data-driven information through education, outreach, and relationship building to improve public safety, the region's economy, and environmental stewardship of our water resources. And we welcome you all to the final presentation of Hazmaton's 2023 Summer, now bleeding into fall, webinar series. These webinars have taken place monthly since May. Today's panel webinar will provide you all with an introduction to tribal spill response programs. And before we get started, I just have a few logistics to share. Um, this webinar is being recorded. The recording uh, with closed captions will be made publicly available on Minnesota Sea Grant's YouTube channel, as well as the Hazardous Material Transport Outreach Network's website. And that will take place within a few weeks of this uh, broadcast as we get um, things captioned. We invite you to submit questions, comments, technical challenges at any time via the question and answer box, the Q&A box in your Zoom toolbar. Um, with this, our question and answer session is going to take place following all three presentations. So we will be hearing from our three presenters. My uh, wonderful colleague, Mark, is going to be introducing each of the three presenters, um, and then we'll do a Q&A session. And there should be plenty of time for questions, so please uh, do keep those questions coming. Um, and if your question is for a specific presenter, make sure that you um, add their name um, into your question so that we know who to direct the question to. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mark Breederland. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, I'm Mark Breederland with Michigan Sea Grant, and I've been in Traverse City, Michigan, and I've been a longtime member of the uh, Hazmaton team. And uh, it is great to uh, have everybody uh, listening into this webinar. And all of our presenters are from what's called the Abtawang Biosphere Region. And I'll put in a uh, kind of a link to that in the uh, chat. But it's really Northwest Lower Michigan, a little bit into Northeast Lower Michigan, and the Eastern part of uh, Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So uh, we're excited to have uh, uh, three speakers here. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first one which is Courtney Hessel. Courtney is uh, works for the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, and she's worked there for about a year and a half. And uh, this is kind of my favorite part, but she was the uh, Marina and Environmental Response Specialist for the first uh, while. And then the last uh, half a year or so, she's been uh, serving as the Environmental Services Specialist. So, um, uh, before the Grand Traverse Band, Courtney received her Master's of Health Science in Environment and Global Health. Um, she's had a lot of training, like the FEMA Incident Command System courses and the lots of EPA trainings. And in uh, April of 2023, she hosted a tabletop exercise. And I know we've had presentations on tabletop uh, exercises in the past. But she, she hosted that for the Grand Traverse Band that brought together the Grand Traverse Band, EPA, U.S. Coast Guard, other local partners, and they continue to work together to uh, prep for potential spills within the reservation. So the goal of the Grand Traverse Band's uh, environmental response program is to continue working with local partners on oil spills in the area and expansion of the program to reach uh, and better protect the Grand Traverse Band and other tribal resources. So... Courtney, we're going to ask you to share your screen and thank you for joining us. Thank you. I forgot I did all that stuff. Um, all right. Let me get my screen going. That sounds great. I'll let you know when it when we can see it and it should be good to go. I can see your slides and the slides oh, yeah. Okay. okay. It's good on my end, so hopefully it's good on yours. Yep, it is. Thank you. Okay, awesome. 
All right. So yes, so like Mark said, um, I'm Courtney Hessel, an environmental services coordinator for the Grand Traverse, ba Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Um, we do have a new environmental response um, specialist, but he's still in, he's so new, he's still in his probationary period even, so I didn't want to set him out to see <laughs> with this presentation, so um, I'm filling in for him, <clears throat> um, but let's get started. Um, so I just wanted to go over a little bit as to even how our programs um, exist. I would say most, if not all of the tribes, um, their environmental response person is funded under this CERCLA 128A grant program through the US EPA. Um, so it's, <clears throat> it encompasses you know, brownfield sites and the emergency response side. Um, so for, I would say for the Grand Traverse Band though, um, we don't really have too much concern with brownfield sites. Um, so our environmental response person leans heavy into the environmental response part, um, the emergency response. So, but I just wanted to make, make it known that this grant exists and this program exists and it's usually how we're all here today. So, um, so the Grand Traverse Band, um, if I say GTB, that's just shorthand, it's just, you know, Grand Traverse Band, but I'll try and say Grand Traverse Band, but so we <clears throat> are in, like Mark said, the northern lower west part of Michigan. Of Michigan. Um, we cover a six county service area, um, which includes um, Antrim, Benzie, Charlevoix, Grand Traverse, Leelanau, and Manistee counties. Um, hopefully you're able to see my mouse. Um, this the, the large yellow portion in Leelanau County up here is Peshawi Town, and that is where our main reservation is located. Um, so right in that west arm of Grand Traverse Bay. Um, and then we have housing units in, so in, in Leelanau, Benzie, Grand Traverse, Antrim, and Charlevoix. Um, we don't have a satellite office or any trust land within Manistee County. Um, but we have a lot of resources there that we are interested in protecting, and we ha do have a lot of uh, GTB members who live there, so we do consider that part of our service area. Um, so a lot of ground to cover. Um, we do have a little bit of, <clears throat> of land out on up, up top here in the Beaver Island. Um, we have uh, two parcels up there, including a marina too, so lots to cover. Um, I just wanted to go over this a little bit since I'm the first presenter today. Um, the others might talk about it as well, but just in case I wanted to throw this in here. Um, so there are a bunch of treaties that <clears throat> um, came about for uh, the Native American tribes, but the one that the Grand Traverse Band um, is a part of is the 1836 Treaty of Washington, um, along with Bay Mills, um, Little River Band, Little Traverse Band, and the Sault Ste. Marie tribe. Um, so we're all here in this darker orange portion. Um, this is the 1836 Treaty of Washington, Washington Territory. Um, so like you saw on the previous slide, you know, we have a six county service area, but really we are interested in this entire orange area for our treaty resources. So those treaty, the treaty rights gave us rights for hunting, fishing, and gathering. So um, I mean, you know, we are interested in the full state of Michigan and all of the Great Lakes, but as far as treaty rights go, we, we are definitely interested in this orange territory here. Um, and then, so diving into our environmental response program a little bit, we have had this trailer for a little while now. It's um, our spill trailer. It contains about 50 feet of the large yellow, yellow containment boom. Um, it does have some smaller, you know, oil only and universal boom in there as well, but then it has um, a lot of universal and oil only pads and socks and all the pillows and all sorts of things. Um, some PPE and, you know, some guidebooks and whatnot, but so this is actually located at our natural resources building, which is conveniently located right next to our uh, Grand Traverse Band's fire and rescue station. So. Um, very convenient because they are probably the ones who use this the most. Um, they tend to get called in by other local townships um, for aid if there's any small spill 
spills and they, they need extra boom or something like that. They know that we have this um, and we're willing to, to share our supplies. So, and then over here, the small orange little container, um, we have that out at our Beaver Island Marina. Um, it's, it's very small, it definitely needs to be updated, um, but it, it's at least something out there. There isn't much activity at that marina for us. Um, so, and it would take a decent amount of money to get a, a trailer of this size out to that uh, Beaver Island. So, but it's in the works, hopefully. Um, um, so just, I wanted to give a little bit of, of background. Um, so I, you know, have been in this, had been in this position for, for a year. Um, and like Mark said in my bio, I, I come from, you know, the environmental health. I came straight from getting my master's degree. So I don't, I didn't necessarily have the practical experience coming into this. Um, it's actually kind of, I never really saw myself getting into this, this realm of things, but um, it has been an awesome learning experience and I really enjoy it. So I only have about a year, a year and a half of experience, but in that in that time, I've taken the these five FEMA ICS training courses, um, which have been awesome. If you haven't taken them, they're they're really cool courses. I actually enjoyed the 300 one more than I thought I was going to. And then um, I just recently was a part of the MySIMS training. If you don't know what that is, it's Michigan's um, environmental response training or system that they use if there's a, like a spill. Um, and then, yeah, the tabletop scenario that we did with the EPA brought together everyone at, at GTB that would be involved with an environmental response. And then also um, the local townships and GFL, who is our um, big cleanup supplier. And then um, I'm just going to go over a couple uh, of our areas of concern. We have this at the very top up here, we have our main marina in Bishabi Town. Um, is where our Great Lakes fisheries biologists work out of and our commercial fishermen. Um, this would be probably our biggest concern as, as far as um, oil spill goes, because there's always boats in and out of here. Um, and there's uh, quite a few commercial fishermen that are active. The second one down here is the Beaver Island Marina. Um, this bottom white building here is the actual marina building. And then this little is, you know, is the ramp with the dock and everything. The area up here is not our land. It looks pretty messy in this Google Earth photo, um, but it's not ours. I just wanted to say that. Um, I don't think it looks like that today though either. Um, and then down here at the bottom left is our Turtle Creek Market gas station. Um, it, uh, you know, the obvious concerns that come with a gas station and, and oil spills. And then um, it, it is mostly on like a flat, you know, flat field land, um, just yeah, in the middle of fields. So like not, not too, too much concern with like runoff situations. There are the storm drains that you can see and then this stormwater basin here, but um, it is a little bit different than this photo down here on the bottom right. This is our Eagle Town Market gas station. So this is across the street from our Leelanau Sands Casino in Fashabi Town. Um, and it is right on the water, as you can see. There's not much wooded land here in between the gas station and the water. So um, not that the Turtle Creek Market isn't as concerning, you know, for an oil spill, but if, if Eagle Town had a big, you know, gas dump or yeah, some sort of leak, um, it would be a little bit more risky leading straight out here into the west arm of the Grand Traverse Bay. Um, Cause water, storm water runs right down in this corner here and straight into a, a, a retention pond, which then leads to the bay. So um, those are our four areas, big areas of concern that we have that could could result in a spill. Um, and then with that, of course, come oil spill plans. Um, we have one for each of those four areas of concern. They all need to be updated, um, which is what we hope to do during this win these winter months when field work is a little bit slower. Um, Beaver Island spill plan in 2016 obviously needs more. And then um, we are finishing up our natural hazards mitigation plan. Um, within Grand Traverse Band, that would be, it's in public comment right now and then has to be um, 
approved by tribal council and then it'll be updated. Um, so most counties have this plan in Michigan as well and um, the tribe and, and so do the tribes. And so we're all updating them kind of around this about the same time right now um, after COVID. So that will be awesome to have with some climate change uh, adaption work in there as well. And then we are, you know, of course, the Northern Michigan area uh, contingency plan. Um, this little excerpt on the side, I just wanted to put to show this is in each of our plans. It just, you know, has contact information, who to call, and then um, um, uh, various like equipment available if there's a release in any of those areas. <clears throat> um, so this was a, I'm going to call it cool because we don't get a whole lot of, <laughs> of oil spills in our area, but so last year, there was one in the Leland River. Um, if anyone's familiar with Leland, Michigan, it's on the very on the west coast, right on, right along Lake Michigan. Um, there was an unknown um, sheen uh, along Leland River, leading straight out into Lake Michigan. This far right photo you can kind of see in the top right corner. It leads that's that's Lake Michigan that you're seeing right out there. So this river leads straight out to Lake Michigan, and so our Fire and Rescue got called to go help Leland Township's fire um, to bring along our spill trailer. And we were able to put out some extra boom um, up top because we really didn't know where it was coming from. Um, so we were just putting it in you know, different contact areas that we could see it. So at the top and then as close to the mouth of the river as we could, as we could get without too heavy of a current for these smaller type booms. Um, we still don't know where it came from. We think, you know, we have an idea potentially. <clears throat> um, it was a really, really rainy day and it could have potentially came from an automotive shop that's right up top on the corner, you know, just like running off into a storm water drain or something, but we will never know um, with this one. But this is these are the types of spills, I would say that we would deal with the most helping out other local townships. Um, within our six county service area. And most really, we pretty much just get called in to help within Leelanau County because we're so close and we have these resources. Um, other than that, we deal with sunken boats. Um, there's only been one since I've been here in the last year and a half, and it was out on Beaver Island uh, at that marina. But yeah, it, it, <clears throat> things have gotten, you know, we've got, gotten better, you know, better rules better guidelines, better, I guess, just knowledge, you know, out there. And um, over time, we've had less and less sunken boats. Um, a lot of the boats these our commercial fishermen use are very old. Um, so they are predisposed to things like oil leaks and holes and that will eventually lead them to sink. Um, but again, we have gotten better. Um, let's see. So so yeah, this was this was actually pretty cool. This was just in May, the very beginning of May. So one of our commercial fishermen um, bought these crazy old boats, <laughs> these crazy old fishing boats, and they were all parked in our marina and just just a disaster waiting to happen. They made it all through the winter, thankfully, um, without sinking, but we really needed to get them out of the water. And he was willing um, just needed some financial help at the, you know, at the time to get them moved. It took, you know, a huge hydraulic system truck and trailer to get these boats out of the water. So he just needed, he needed some financial help. And we were able to, um, actually our conservation officers were able to scrounge up some money to help him with that. So um, we got all four of his boats out of the water. It took our whole, our whole natural resources department came together, all of our programs pretty much to help him with this. And um, they're parked by one of his uh, properties right now, hopefully to be moved um, soon. Um, but they are they are quite old, but they are they are pretty awesome boats if you can kind of see in these photos. They're huge. Um, um, so the future of our program, um, definitely updating our spill plans. Um, they're pretty out of date. They all have you know outdated names in them, which I would probably just take out, but. Um, getting those updated and, you know, maybe adding some more detail after we had that tabletop training scenario um, with the EPA, it was really, really cool to see, um, like, you know, where, where our spill plans could be better. Um, and then 
how we could update our current spill trailers inventory um, just based on like what the our, who we would who we would call for a, a large scale spill where we didn't have enough um, supplies or, or experience to, to help you know to clean up ourselves. We would call this company called GFL. They have um, a huge spill trailer. Um, so just seeing what their spill trailer looked like compared to ours and you know how we could make ours better. So hopefully we'll be able to keep updating that with things. Um, getting a full spill trailer out at Beaver Island would be awesome. Um, figuring that out. It's a, an hour and a half drive and a, like a 20 minute plane ride, but I don't, it is a, there is a ferry and yeah, just, just is a lot, a lot of hoops to jump through, but hopefully we'll be able to get one out there soon. Um, I would like to keep up on those tabletop exercises that we did. Maybe it doesn't have to be annually, but um, it would be really nice if it was um, just because it brought together so many different, so many different partners, different, you know, local fire, fire crew, um, uh, police officers, or, you know, the first, you know, emergency responders, health departments came. So it was, it was really cool to have everybody in the same room. Um, and then the big one would be to hopefully hold a boom deployment exercise, um, not only for GTB, but for um, any other, also any other tribe and, and local partner that could make it over for the day. We would really like to have that just to get our equipment in the water and um, get our staff trained up on that. And then I just wanted to put this quick here at the end. Um, this is what it's in our spill plans, but again, it's our, you know, just some contact information if if anyone ever needed anything. So, and I think that is all I have. A little under 20 minutes, but I think that's what I got. Courtney, thanks. That was fantastic. And to hear of the experiences and preparedness that uh, your team has put together, so. Uh, we are going to go then, I think, right in again. Uh, let's use the question and answer uh, box, and um, we will be glad to both uh, do those kind of ongoing as well. Yeah, but uh, we're going to go a little bit north of the Grand Traverse Bay region up to the Little Traverse Bay region. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Traven Michaels. Uh, Traven has been the environmental uh, response specialist for the Little Traverse Bay bands of Odawa Indians for over seven years. And he has the uh, much spill response experience to match. So he's participated in over 30 different spill response trainings, written multiple oil spill response plans, procured two different oil response uh, trailers, oil response trailers, and hosted annual boom deployment exercises. And he's been a key part of the uh, unified command as a tribal liaison for the ATC cable response several years ago now that was up at the Mackinac Straits. With all that under his belt, he hopes to continue expanding the Little Traverse Bay Band's response program in the coming years in order to better protect tribal resources and promote uh, tribal tribal sovereignty. So, Traven, thank you for putting this together, and uh, we'll have you uh, share your screen and take it away. And again, thanks, everybody, for putting in questions, and we'll go from there. Already, mic check. Can yes. you hear me? All right, mic good. check. Cool. And uh, screens are looking good. Everything's everything's looking good on your end. All good. Sweet. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my portion here. I'm just trying to get my laser pointer in action. Hopefully, everyone can chase around my laser pointer. Uh, I actually just at at my house. We just got a new kitten. Uh, her name is Penelope. Uh, her nickname is Cookie because she looks a lot like a, a cookie with her fur, but she loves chasing around laser pointers. So hopefully you guys can uh, take after Penelope in my uh, presentation today. Uh, again, my name is Traven Michaels. I am the environmental response specialist for Little Traverse Bay Bands of Wadaw Indians. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I have been here for over seven years now. In the coming May, I will have been with the tribe for eight years. Before doing this position, I was the Youth Conservation Corps leader for about half a year. So here is our, uh, my title slide here has our uh, Natural Resources Department logo, as well as our um, wider tribal logo. 
as well as a beautiful sunset over Little Traverse Bay. I think this is a pretty old picture, actually, because the the lighthouse, I think that's the old lighthouse. Uh, in the past 10 years, they've they've replaced that lighthouse and that whole break wall. Um, so an older picture, but the sunsets are still just as beautiful. Um, so those of you who know a little bit about uh, Anishinaabe culture, uh, Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians is an Anishinaabe tribe, uh, and that is our spoken language. So historically, this area was known as Waganakasing, which is land of the crooked tree. So expanding upon uh, where is Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, um, Courtney did a great job explaining the 1836 treaty, um, which encompasses this gray area here. Um, I, it's important to mention that Little Traverse Bay Bands is one of the, the Cora tribes. You can see Cora right here. Cora stands for Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority. And that includes that includes the uh, the five tribes that are listed on this map here. Uh, Cora is an organization that uh, brings together those those five tribes in order to work towards shared goals such as consent decrees, um, as well as you know spill response type of uh, type of issues, uh, as well as fishing rights and other types of treaty rights. Um, a lot of focus on fish, fishing and response with Cora, for sure. Uh, so here's Little Traverse Bay Bands. Um, here's Grand Traverse, which is uh, Courtney, and then some of the other tribes that are in Cora. And then we zoom in to the historical uh, reservation here in Emmett and Charlevoix counties. Uh, unfortunately, um, over the past um, 10 years or so, and there's been a case in federal court where our tribe was trying to reaffirm this historical reservation boundary um, officially that was negotiated back uh, similar to the 1836 treaty. Our reservation boundary was negotiated back in the late 1800s and up into like the mid 1900s. Unfortunately, that federal case did not turn out in our favor but our tribe still recognizes the historical reservation boundary, which is, as you can see, it's this um, western half of Emmett County here, as well as this uh, northeastern corner of, of Charlevoix County. The red uh, parcels are all of the parcels that the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians currently own. So it's kind of a checkerboard system if you don't acknowledge that reservation boundary which again, we still uh, completely acknowledge that. And we do work within that boundary as well as outside of that boundary. You can see, you know, we've got some parcels that are technically east of our reservation um, boundary over here, as well as we've got some parcels on the Beaver Island Archipelago uh, or Archipelago, however you pronounce that. Uh, I've heard it both ways. Uh, St. Martin's Island, as well as we've even been starting to purchase some properties up in the Upper Peninsula. So moving on, uh, LTB res reservation and points of interest slash areas of concern. Uh, as I kind of mentioned in the last slide, we've got our land base is Western Emmett County, Northeastern corner of Charlevoix County, and we own those parcels outside of the historical reservation boundaries. Uh, some of the primary transportation routes that go through our, um, our area are US 31 and I-75. There's some, some lesser, um, lesser routes that go through, obviously, but uh, those are two of, our, two of our main highways. In terms of our points of interest and areas of concern, uh, I kind of took a broader view than Courtney did in her in her presentation. I guess I I just went more regionally. So Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. Um, so there's Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, connected by the Straits of Mackinac, uh, as well as we have many many inland lakes in our area, uh, including all of those in this lake here or in this lake in this uh, on this bullet here, as well as rivers and streams. Um, and this list here, 
wetlands. We've got over 45,000 acres uh, across our uh, reservation boundaries, uh, including um, parcels that the tribe has purchased just in order to preserve the environment and to preserve wetlands. We've got some parcels in, in Mackinac City as well in as well as uh, a couple other locations that are meant specifically for wetlands preservation. And as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, we've got those parcels on the islands of Beaver, High, Garden, St. Martins. Uh, those islands were extremely important to Little Traverse Bay bands, as well as other uh, bands of Anishinaabeg people uh, since time immemorial. So those are some of our areas of concern. I recognized that I forgot um, Courtney's presentation jogged my memory. I should have listed our uh, gas station as well. We do have one tribal gas station called Bindigan, which means welcome in Anishinaabe in the language. And so that is that would be another area of concern as well. Moving on to the next slide here, we've got our primary risks. Our gas station could probably go in, in, this, uh, in this list as well. But I did want to specifically mention some of these bullets here. Uh, Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline, which you can see um, its route through Michigan here in this picture. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline is a 70-year-old um, pipeline that uh, is owned by Enbridge, which is a Canadian corporation. It comes um, from Canada down into the United States, um, into the Upper Peninsula. It runs along the US-2 corridor up here, down underneath the Straits. It is It sits at the bottom of the lake bed here in, in the Straits as a dual pipeline and then down into the lower peninsula where it crosses our uh, our historical reservation boundary up here in the north, goes further south into uh, Sarnia, back into Canada. This particular map has the green pins. It's from an article from MLive from a couple of years back that highlights all of the different oil spills that have happened along the route of Line 5 um, in its 70-year lifespan. Uh, our tribe, as well as all the other tribes, uh, federally recognized tribes in Michigan has a resolution calling for the shutdown of Line 5 due to the fact that our tribes believe that uh, the risks far outweigh the benefits. Uh, an oil spill in the Straits or really anywhere along the route of Line 5 could cause irreparable damage to um, some of our most important cultural, historical, and environmental resources. Um, but as long as Line 5 and things... Uh, similar to it exist, we will always have a response program uh, ready to respond in the event of a worst case scenario, um, which we believe is not an if, but when. So we've got other utilities um, in, our, in our reservation area. I don't have to get into all of those, but you can imagine, you know, gas pipelines, others, other fossil fuel infrastructure, um, super fun sites, and things like that that could potentially cause releases. We've got obviously the Straits of Mackinac as well as other areas uh, that we work in are um, a main shipping lane. So we're worried about you know any kind of issues with ships going through. Um, this would include things like anchor drags, which caused the ATC cable incident a couple of years back. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're worried about our transportation corridors major highways and things like that. Um, recreation and tourism, you can see uh, this is our love-hate relationship with these kinds of folks in the area. We love them because they're economic drivers and they boost our economy. But uh, maybe I shouldn't use the word hate, but uh, sometimes we have some disdain for them because uh, they're, they're not always the greatest drivers and they don't always treat us locals with a lot of respect. So anyways, that's just, just a little bit of joking around there. We really do have a tourist-based economy. But with the influx of all these people every summer, uh, that just increases the likelihood of having um, spills and things like that, especially from transportation-related incidents. Um, commercial fishing and other vessels, including like our, our um, commercial fishers that work for the tribe, 
um, sorry, they don't work for the tribe, but they're tribal citizens, as well as other vessels like our research vessels that our natural resources department operate. Uh, we do have some small pockets of industry in our area, not a ton, uh, but there are a few um, industrial areas, especially historically, that we uh, keep an eye on, um, as well as, you know, I think we all know with things like climate change continuing to uh, impact our world and our country, population growth in this area is definitely a concern in the next, uh, in the coming decades. Uh, so with larger populations come a lot more of all this other stuff. So here's our primary program contacts. If you ever need to get in touch with Little Traverse Bay bands, uh, especially if there's a spill or anything like that, I'm going to be the first one to call. Um, if I, for some reason, uh, do not answer or or respond right away, if you're trying to get a hold of me, uh, there's these other um, folks that you could definitely give a call. Uh, Caroline Mullering is my environmental services manager. We've got our natural resources department director, Doug Craven, as well as our safety slash emergency management um, employee, David. So any of those folks will be good to call if you've got any kind of questions on a, on a presentation like this, or if you've got a concern about an oil spill or any other kind of chemical spill that might be impacting any of our lands that I've been talking about so far. Um, I probably should have listed, like Courtney did, our police as well as our conservation enforcement folks, um, but all that information can be uh, readily accessible on our uh, on our LTBB website. So I definitely recommend checking out our tribal website. It just got an overhaul in the last couple of years, so it's looking really nice. Um, and I just wanted to include um, include that I am a responder, so I do things like this. I go out with the U.S. Coast Guard, and I do trainings on, on responding to environmental disasters. But I also am a responder outside of work uh, because I am a musician, in this particular photo, I am responding to the crowd's need for a ripping sax solo. Response trainings and experience. As I mentioned, I've got over seven years of experience, including the 40-hour Hazwhopper and the annual eight-hour refreshers. I've been through all the ICS courses, as well as the, um, the forms course, National Incident Management System, National Response Framework, um, liaison, tribal emergency response, public information officer, and tons of other FEMA courses. Um, the Center for Domestic Preparedness generally hosts a tribal nations training week, um, one week out of the year. Uh, usually in March, I've been to two of those that have gotten me um, a lot more training in terms of ICS type of stuff. Uh, I've been through SCAT training, shoreline cleanup assessment technique training, Inland Oil Spill Response for Department of Interior. I try to host um, annual boom deployment trainings with the equipment that I'm going to get to next. A uh, big shout out to TNT Marine, which is a Marine salver as well as an Osro that we work with and um, that was able to sell us our wilderness trailer that I'll mention coming up as well. Those guys are great to work with, especially uh, the CEO, Mike Popa and, and his sons. Uh, those guys were instrumental in, in getting this program uh, to where it is today. So big shout out to those guys. And thank you a lot for all your help. A um, couple years ago, actually during COVID, LTB hosted a spill response tabletop and also, you know, boom training. It was, it was all virtual because it was during COVID, but we did host that with EPA. Um, more to come, as you'll see. Uh, annual NMAC, Northern Michigan Area Committee, and Enbridge tabletop exercises and full-scale exercises are things that I'm always trying to, to get out there and be a part of. So this, uh, this picture here is from the full-size or the full-scale exercise that happened this past summer through the Northern Michigan Area Committee. Uh, they simulated a um, total release of a couple million gallons, I believe it was, from this, this oil um, repository here on the frog pond is what they called it over in Rogers City, Michigan. So that was a really great training, awesome opportunity to be a part of an incident management team, part of a unified command representing tribes. I even did a little interview with some uh, local 
with some local news stations and got to see all sorts of fun, cool new toys that responders are using uh, to uh, and technology that responders are using to respond these days. In terms of our responses that we've actually like participated in or responded to, I've responded to a couple of sewage spills associated with our water treatment plant that services our casino. Uh, there's been a couple small chemical spills that I've been a part of. Um, oil spills, you can look up in the corner here and notice some diesel sheen in the riprap. Um, this was this last summer as well. It was a classic marina type of spill. Didn't really, we never really figured out where that came from. Uh, and unfortunately, by the time I made it there, there wasn't really any point in putting down any kind of boom or anything like that. We did put down some sorbent pads, but uh, at that point, most of it had dissipated. I did get the call from some tribal citizens who, who have first uh, noticed the rainbow sheen. So thanks to those guys for letting me know about it. But unfortunately, you know, fortunately, it wasn't a huge spill with thick oil. But unfortunately, we were, I didn't get there in quite enough time to to really mop any of it up um, before it was dispersed. Um, I mentioned a couple times throughout this presentation already that I was a part of the ATC cable incident where the ship went through the straits dragging an anchor and cut a old transmission line, American transmission company's transmission line that had some dielectric fluid in the cables that was released into the straits. Uh, the anchor did... Um, caused some minimal damage to line five, dinged off of line five, which was, which is terrifying for, for us to think about. Thank God nothing worse happened. Um, but that was a great chance for me to put my skills into practice and be a part of a unified command and shout out to my, uh, to my supervisor, Caroline, for covering for me in that unified command when I couldn't make it. Um, LTBB commercial and recreational ship releases, there's been a couple of small incidents in terms of those. Um, our biodiesel shed that is kind of fallen into disrepair, I've been helping to clean that up using some of my response knowledge, um, kind of in a similar situation to Courtney. With the ships, it was just cars for us. We had a lot of cars, old vehicles, employee vehicles, and um, some citizens vehicles and whatnot kind of building up behind our natural resources department. So I helped um, get those taken care of and disposed of properly and off site to avoid any kind of, you know, chemical and oil spills coming from those old vehicles. And then I should have added the bullet where uh, I have helped respond to a couple of small oil spills at our gas station Bindigan that I spoke to before. Uh, the last picture that I've got on this slide is is an example of a of a kind of spill response layout kind of plan that I used in the uh, in the work that I did with EPA back during the COVID when we had our virtual training. Let's see here. So this is our response equipment. I don't have to spend a ton of time on this since Courtney kind of already explained what is in these types of trailers, and a lot of you probably know. Um, Minogan Market was our first trailer. That's the one in this picture right here. It's our smallest trailer with 100 feet of containment boom, sorbit boom, and, and, and the like, ERGs, emergency response guides, and, and things like that. Uh, Wilderness State Park's Cabins trailer is the one that I mentioned earlier. That's uh, the back of it can be seen in this picture with a couple of our folks participating in a uh, boom deployment exercise. That is the one that I worked uh, to purchase through TNT and the, and Mike Popa and those guys. So that is a much larger trailer, um, but it's got a lot more, um, a lot more equipment stored in it. The 500 feet of boom, um, the storage drums, anchors, um, PP, lots of PPE, steel stakes and drivers, which are, uh, the more trainings I go to, the more I realize that steel stakes and drivers are like really, really helpful when you're trying to put out um, boom, if there's any kind of wind um, or if there's any kind of current, those are super helpful. Obviously, anchors are very helpful as well. And then our most recently uh, obtained trailer was through U.S. Coast Guard. They kind of had a disposal of assets process where um, they had some some equipment that they weren't really utilizing anymore or they were planning on um, replacing. So 
we were able to work with U.S. Coast Guard and have them uh, pretty much donate to us a trailer very similar to the Wilderness uh, trailer that we have up there. Uh, and that one is stationed. Uh, so I, I forgot to mention, Minogan Market trailer is stationed in Mackinac City. The Wilderness State Park cabins trailer is obviously stationed at one of our parcels in Wilderness State Park. That is where we generally have our annual boom deployment is at that location. Um, and then the John Keyshick boat launch trailer is where uh, U.S. Coast Guard trailer is where we have um, that trailer to cover the Little Traverse Bay area. Um, and that is pretty much halfway between Emmett County and, and Charlevoix County on 31 there. Uh, one thing I did want to mention in terms of these trailers is you've got to keep up on your maintenance. And one of the things that I did uh, a couple summers ago for these trailers to keep the keep them in good shape, especially in terms of waterproofing, was I bought a product called Liquid Rubber, and I highly recommend it. Not a sponsor, but I, I highly recommend it to anyone who's trying to uh, keep your trailers looking really good on the inside. I painted essentially the entire bottom of the trailer and about halfway up the walls with this liquid rubber. And it does a great job, especially if you're doing trainings and taking um, boom out, getting it wet and putting it back in and things like that. Um, it does a great job of protecting the wooden interior of your trailer from, from getting mold and rotting out and things like that. So again, not a sponsor, but liquid rubber is, is really good stuff. Um, and then this picture right here in the corner was from one of our boom deployment exercises. I'm really proud of this Chevron, uh, the Chevron configuration that we're able to do in order to protect our shoreline in, in the event of a real issue. So that, that looked, that looks really great. And if you look really closely, you can see the Mackinac Bridge right back here in the background. So beautiful area that we want to protect. In terms of our response plans, I've written one fully fleshed out response plan for our Wilderness State Park property that I was just kind of uh, talking about. This is uh, this is that Chevron from that last picture in its um, in its infancy before we got out there and tried it. You know, I was I put uh, this together just using Microsoft Paint. You know, you don't have to have super complicated programs and and you know knowledge in order to use Microsoft Paint to to draw out some booming. Uh, diagrams and things like that. So the red line is our parcel, and this was the diagram that we would use for large volumes of oil and higher wave height. I've got a couple of other um, diagrams in that plan for different kind of scenarios that you might deal with. Uh, this plan was reviewed by EPA and some different OSROs, including Team T Marine, uh, and they all gave me very positive feedback. So I'm very proud of that. Um, Proud of that response plan, and I update it annually. And then I have almost completed a Minogan Market property, which you might remember is on the other side of the Straits in Mackinac City. I've almost completed that plan. In terms of the future, we've got uh, the John Kesey boat launch, some inland lake scenarios, rivers, streams, wetlands. We could really keep writing plans uh, forever, but. We really rely on partners like the U.S. Coast Guard, Regional Response Team Five, et cetera, and their um, and their area contingency plans um, to to help us where we might have gaps that we're trying to fill. So, coming this spring, speaking of uh, trainings and things like that, I am working with uh, John Gulch of EPA to uh, to plan out a inland lake spill scenario on French Farm, our beautiful French Farm Lake here. Uh, we're going to be doing a day of tabletop exercising as well as a boom deployment training. Uh, so anyone who's interested can feel free to reach out to me using the contact information uh, that I provided earlier. If you're interested in coming to that training, I'd be we'd be more than happy to to have you. And there's more information yet to come, agendas and and things like that and locations. Um, but if you do decide to join us this next spring, depending on when we decide to actually have it, you might get to see some of these beautiful wildflowers that we have here in, in northwestern Michigan in the spring. Wildflowers like lady slippers, trilliums, and spring beauties. So in order to uh, wrap up my presentation here, I always like to 
be very grounded in knowing what I and we are protecting. This is these pictures describe what we're protecting. We're protecting our tribal citizens and their ability to exercise their treaty rights by doing things like uh, subsistence and commercial fishing, like what like what's going on right here. Um, this is my uh, this is another employee in the environmental services program, uh, Sheila, and she uh, she really loves exercising her treaty rights um, when she can get out there in the field. Uh, we've got three little baby sturgeon. Uh, our hatchery works on raising sturgeon and releasing them every year into the sturgeon river. It's, and they also do have a sturgeon in the classroom program where they give fish to uh, local elementary schools for them to help raise them. So this is a very culturally significant species that we're working to protect. Uh, this is a picture of some tribal citizens out in a wild rice bed using the traditional um, harvesting technique um, with, with sticks and push poles. The sticks are called knockers. And so they bend the wild rice shoots over the canoe and use their two knockers to knock the wild rice into the canoe in order for it to be uh, processed on shore later. Uh, so French Farm Lake that I mentioned last slide is actually one of our lakes that has some of this wild rice, which is called monoman in the language, uh, the food that grows on the water. So we want to protect that at all costs because it is uh, a species that is very fragile and it needs very specific growing conditions in order to in order to really thrive and it's been a food source for for the tribe for since time immemorial this right here is a picture of the bear river we want to protect our beautiful rivers and greenways this is a picture of the shoreline along wilderness state park we want to protect our beautiful shorelines this is a picture of some sweet grass um, we want to protect our traditional medicines. And this is a picture of a tribal citizen selling um, organic fruits and vegetables that are grown at our tribal farm, Zibi Mijiwang, which is over in Carp Lake, Michigan. We want to protect our ability to grow good, healthy foods for, for our tribal citizens and things like that. So um, I hope I didn't go too over my 20 minutes, but that is that is my section of the, the presentation. And I really appreciate to everyone attending and everyone listening. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions at the end. Bama pi. Thanks so much, Traven, for all your uh, diligence and your team's work up there and preparedness. And um, so great. Uh, we will have time for questions. Um, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to go a little bit further north for the third uh, portion of our panel and um, introduce Jennifer Satchel. You may have noticed that uh, we had Jesse Wesselek, the Air Quality and Environmental Response Specialist for the Bay Mills Indian Community listed, but he wasn't able to join us, but uh, Jennifer was kindly able to uh, join us. So Jennifer Satchel is the Environmental Coordinator for the Bay Mills Indian Community. She has her bachelor's degree from Northern Michigan University and a master's degree from Michigan State, has over five years experience in the environmental contamination field. She's HAZWOPR certified and is assisting uh, to expand the Bay Mills Indian Community Environmental Response Programs. And we checked the, um, the internet connections were a little bit tough, so she may keep, we've encouraged her to maybe keep her video off, but uh, Jennifer, you're welcome to... Um, uh, it looks like your slides are up and um, just uh, unmute and thank you for taking time to present to us today. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, it's been really great to hear what my colleagues from other tribes have been doing regarding uh, spill response. And I will just start off by saying that Bay Mills Indian community is, um, we've just started working on our response programs. So it's really, uh, it's great to hear, especially what's going on um, in, in Traven's world and hopefully we'll get there someday. Uh, I am uh, the environmental coordinator from Bay Mills Indian Community, also known as Ganusha Kaning, uh, which is the place of the pike. I just wanna talk a little bit about the picture that you're seeing here. In the forefront is Spectacle Lake, which is an inland lake that's very important to the Bay Mills Indian community people. And off to the right-hand side, you'll see 
um, like there's some stuff in the lake and that are that that's the community's wild rice beds. We have a couple of them and that's one area where we are working to grow our wild rice beds so that those can be used by our tribal members. And in the background, you'll see some more water and that is the St. Mary's River, which um, to the left and off the picture is Lake Superior. So we're surrounded by water. Water is very important to the community. This area is also very rural and um, the closest community is a closest large community and I say large in quotes, is Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, with a population of about 13,500 13, people. A little more about what I do. Um, as Mark mentioned, my colleague, Jesse Westlock, was not able to participate today. And I mostly assist her with spill response duties. I mostly work in the realm of brownfields, and then I do a bunch of random other stuff related to solid waste and recycling and energy um, programs. So, um, but happy to talk to you today. Next slide, please. This shows the land base of Bay Mills Indian community. As you can see, we're dispersed through the northern part of the Eastern Upper Peninsula. The main part of the land base is that teal blue color. You can see the word mission there. Um, and then off to the far right, you'll see um, another area of teal on the other side of the St. Mary's River. And that is um, our Sugar Island community. And that's all reservation land. Um, we also have some fee land as well. All in all, Bay Mills Indian community encompasses about 3,900 acres of fee and trust land. And we have, we're working towards 460 residences. Some of those are being built out now. The community has 2,350-ish members and about 700 of those reside on the reservation. Next slide, please. Uh, as Courtney and Traven also discussed, uh, we are also a Cora tribe, and um, we are also located in the 1836 treaty area. We have the St. Mary's River flowing through the northern part of our, or to the bond, bordering the northern part of the reservation and commercial vessel traffic moves through this area between nine to 10 months of the year, depending on the ice and the, the Sioux St. Marie locks do need to close down for a couple of months every year. So that halts shipping traffic, even if there is an ice cover. There are some concerns related to having this commercial traffic coming through the area. For example, in 2016, the freighter, the Roger Blau, um, it was grounded on Grow Cap Reef, which was very close by to the reservation. So uh, we were pretty concerned about that. It all worked out okay for us, but um, uh, there's always concerns about the shipping traffic coming through here. Water-based recreation is also a big part of life up here. So as Shaven mentioned, lots of tourism up in up in our area as well, not quite to the extent as in the Petoskey area, but um, there are a lot of recreationists up here who like to take advantage of all of this wonderful water, as well as people who live here as well. The tribal fishers of our community utilize the waters of the St. Mary's River and Lake Superior, both for subsistence and commercial fishing. Um, and as mentioned before, the tribe has wild rice beds in Spectacle Lake and also in some of the bays of the St. Mary's River. The Waishki River flows through a lot of agricultural land before it outlets into the St. Mary's River near the town of Brimley. And this is located a bit east of the reservation. I used to work for our local conservation district and I do know from experience that uh, the Waishki River and its tributaries flow through um, quite a bit of farmland. And while this is a presentation more about oil spills, um, there are, are also concerns about possible manure spills in the area. 
and um, there are several areas that uh, livestock setbacks have not been implemented. So sometimes there's cattle in the river. Most farms up here are growing livestock and hay and don't use chemicals or fertilizers. So farm related chemical spills are not really a concern so much. There are also several bridges over many sections of the river and its tributaries. So a release coming from a ve from vehicle traffic is always something for us to consider as well. Bay Mills Indian Community also operates a gas station and that's located right across the road from the Waishki River, just before it empties into the St. Mary's River. And like most gas stations, uh, our gas station has in the past um, had two leaking underground storage tanks, um, not necessarily while they were under ownership of the tribe. So that is working on cleaning that up is, is part of what we are working on. And a spill at that gas station is always something that's of concern for us. As you can see, there's a lot of acres of wetland. When you consider um, that our land base is about 3,900 acres and about 1,000 of that is wetland, it kind of gives you the idea that um, land that is not wetland is a premium. So we definitely try to be uh, really thoughtful about development in the area. Lakeshore Drive is pretty much the only road through the reservation. So if anything were to happen on Lakeshore Drive uh, and the road were to close down, it's a 30 mile detour through dirt back roads that wind through forest service land. So um, uh, closing down Lakeshore Drive would always be a concern for us. And it has happened in the past. There was, it, it washed out in the seventies, which really caused a lot of issues and concerns for the community. I'm not going to talk a lot about Enbridge Line 5, but we do echo the same concerns that Traven presented um, regard in his workshop in his presentation. Next slide, please. The primary program contacts are Jesse Westlock and myself. And as I mentioned before, she's our main environmental response specialist. And she's been working in this area for around 10-ish years. And I've spent about five years working in the area, in this area, about, although a couple of them were more ag related. We've gone through a variety of trainings and we are working on um, working harder at, at attending more trainings so that we're, we're better able to respond in a really good way. Next slide, please. We have a spill response trailer very similar to the trailers that Traven and Courtney have um, in their uh, programs. And um, you saw the slides from Traven's about the type of materials that are contained within ours are very, very similar as well. We also have many of these universal bag spill kits, which we find them really handy to give out to people. We often give them out at events. Um, we've given out several to boaters at the boat launch. So um, those, are, those are really good talking points to people. We can give those out, kind of talk about why they might need them and how to use them and, and things that can prevent them from having to use them. Next slide, please. We're still working on our community response plans related to spill response, but the tribe also has several other plans already, or we are involved in other um, agency or regional plans. So we have a community response plan, which is more related to like weather events um, and more like um, environmental emergencies, kind of like that. We have a source water protection plan. We're part of the, our County's Hazard Mitigation Plan, also the Northern Michigan Area Contingency Plan, and our local townships. We're part of two different townships. Uh, we're part of those plans, and we also have some MOUs in place. Next slide, please. 
I'm just going to talk about a couple of the spills that have happened in the area um, since since I've been here. Um, well, actually, one of them was before I got here, but I'm still dealing with it. So we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. The first one is um, the Algoma steel spill that occurred downstream of the mainland portion of our reservation. However, it was above the portion of the reservation that's on Sugar Island. So we were really concerned about what impacts this spill might have on um, the Sugar Island Reservation. The release was discovered on June 9th at 6.20 in the morning when a tank of bulk oil overflowed in the basement of the Algoma Steel Mill. And this first notification said that possibly 5,300 gallons had spilled. Algoma Steel is actually on the Canadian side of the river. So um, there was multiple uh, agencies that responded to that spill, both from Canada and the United States. By 10 a.m., the oil was actually contained. And um, after going through and doing a little more investigating, it was determined that approximately 330 gallons were what actually spilled into the St. Mary's River. And then by two days later, no sheen was seen anymore by responders. It was a very light oil that was, um, it broke up pretty quickly. Monitoring stations at that point showed no more material was detected. There was further investigation about the cause of the spill and Algoma Steel is now working to implement or has already implemented engineering solutions and they're making recommendations to prevent future spills. And long-term monitoring and risk assessments for environmental and human health are ongoing. And uh, the response effort was evaluated and recommendations were made for improvement and training. As for the tribe, um, we were very concerned because of the trust land on uh, Sugar Island along the St. Mary's River and this spill was moving towards Sugar Island through the St. Mary's River, but it ended up, because of the wind that day, it ended up pushing more north of Sugar Island and um, it impacted the Canadian shoreline, unfortunately. And Jessie, um, my counterpart here, she at the time was working for through, with um, Lake Superior State University Center for Freshwater Research and Education. And they had just um, started a program with oil sensors. So they deployed an oil sensor during that time. And I, I don't believe that it picked anything up. Next slide, please. This was the first event that I responded to, um, actually, and, and pretty much the only event that I've responded to so far. I uh, received a, a call from our tribal president who said that a vessel was submerged in the marina that's located at Bay Mills Resort and Casino. And I just have to say that this was an excellent learning opportunity for me and really made me realize um, the things that we needed to fix and the things that we did okay. And um, it would have been better if we had maybe figured all this out over a tabletop exercise, but we just weren't there yet with our response program. Uh, when I got the call, it was, we had just had a snowfall. As you can see that there's snow all around the marina area and, and it had been snowing for a while. And the first thing I learned was we need to remember to keep our spill trailer shoveled out because I spent the first 20 minutes shoveling out a spill trailer so that I could get to it. When I arrived on the scene, um, our public works department was already trying to hoist the vessel and um, several people were there, <coughs> excuse me, and they were pumping water out of the vessel as well, so it was it was being refloated at the time, but not quite there yet. Um, I notified the National Response Center, which is what our protocol is when there's a spill, 
um, and EPA, and also the Coast Guard. Although if you send, if you call into the NRC, they'll notify those agencies as well. It was, there was a sheen on the water and it would, it, I had a very hard time um, speaking with the owner of the vessel. He was very busy trying to get the, get it floating again. Um, and so it was really hard for me to know what actually was happening there. Eventually the Coast Guard actually did just drive out, which is really handy. They are only 15 miles away in Sault Ste. Marie. So they, it, we knew that it wasn't a huge spill, but it was really hard to know. And because I was so new, I didn't know the sheen that was spreading all across the marina. So I, I didn't know whether it was a lot or a little, but the Coast Guard came out and they said, well, it looks like it's a pretty small spill and they provided guidance, which was really wonderful. So what had happened was the night before, they were trying to load this vessel on a trailer that they hadn't ever used before. And um, it, they had a really hard time loading it. And in fact, they couldn't load it. So they put the vessel back in the water. And in the process of trying to load the vessel on the trailer, they had punctured a hole in it. And then throughout the night, it had sunk. After I was able finally to talk to the operator, he was talking about, he, he confirmed that none of the tanks, the gas tanks had leaked and he didn't have any um, oil that was coming out in area. He, he was pretty sure it wasn't an, a, any sort of oil spill, but he did let me know that he kept a carpet on the deck of the vessel and that's where he stored his gas cans. And it, he'd been storing them on the carpet of the vessel for years. And um, it was decided that the sheen actually came from the gas that had dripped onto the carpet over all those years. And um, definitely just a couple of gallons had spilled. And the Coast Guard felt that this was probably accurate as well. The vessel owner was responsible to clean up the spill and he wasn't super cooperative, but eventually did use um, the absorbent pads, which I did provide to help clean up the spill. I also learned that it would have been really helpful to have access to a boat during this. Um, I would have tried to probably deploy some boom. Um, you can't see this in the picture, but at the head of the marina, um, it, there, there was an ice cover there. So some boom could have been deployed over there but I just didn't have the, the necessary equipment to get that taken care of. Next slide, please. This spill happened before I was um, hired for Bay Mills. However, it is now a brownfield site and we've been working to clean up this site ever since. It, as you can see on the left picture, there is a fuel tank and a pump. And these are in um, spill containment um, containers, which are, which is wonderful. They're concrete and um, they're designed to collect spill. However, what happened here was this was part of our public works department and they had moved to a new location. And when they moved, I think they just kind of forgot about this place. And so all this material that was stored in here eventually overfilled with rainwater. And uh, the, you know, while it's great that there's spill containment here, um, one of the challenges with this type of containment is that there's nothing overhead to keep the water, snow, the, the rainwater out and any sort of snow and snow melt out. So it eventually overflowed um, and it caused the drums to leak. And this was discovered um, in the summer by somebody who just happened to be driving past there. As you can see, um, there's staining of the soil out in front of it. So the Bay Mills Biological Department um, responded. We did have that spill trailer, so they responded the best that they could, but really what we, uh, and, and that was great, but what ultimately had to happen was we had to hire a contractor to manage the cleanup of this. And as I've mentioned, it's, we're still working on it. 
When the bio staff noticed the spill, they contacted uh, the NRC and, um, and the response started there. Next slide, please. What's next for us? Um, we are updating and creating spill response plans. Um, we are working on cross-departmental trainings and um, are going to be participating in the Northern Michigan Area Committee work group to um, develop some exercises. Um, and we also are going to be working on training, which we didn't list here. Next slide. And uh, miigwech, which means thank you. And we appreciate um, your time listening to uh, what we've got going on here at Bay Mills. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, and uh, to, to everybody for uh, the great presentations. And uh, Kelsey, I think I'm going to turn it back to you because we've been seeing some great questions come in. And I think maybe you can uh, uh, voice those to some of our panelists and, and we can uh, interact for a few minutes and then we'll get everybody out. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you to the presenters. I'm going to start, I'm going to just jump right in and I'm going to ask um, Courtney, Traven, Jennifer, whichever one of you wants to answer this question, um, please feel free. Um, we have a question about how much outreach you do with your community members to prepare your community members um, to detect and report oil spills and educate them about the trailers and what's in the trailers. Um, yeah, just kind of a little bit more information about um, some of the community outreach that you do as part of your work. Uh, I guess I can go first on that one. I That's an area of our program that we're kind of still getting back up to speed after COVID, um, which which hurt our, our efforts in that area. But we're definitely getting back there. Uh, we um we keep our website very much updated there's a whole um, page of our website dedicated to the circle 128a program that courtney mentioned um including my contact information a lot of information about uh, the four elements of a brownfields program as well as a, a good amount of information on our em emergency response activities as well so definitely um you know putting things out through our web page and our social media is a way that we do that. Um, we just started a we just started a um, effort to put out information into our uh, tribal newspaper every couple of months from our program. Uh, so that is exciting. Um, I'm actually working on a article right now about uh, reducing hazardous household wastes and things like that. Uh, we try to show up to community events whenever we can, um, which, you know, include things like our annual tribal community meeting, um, tabling events, uh, elders luncheons, um, uh, things like that. We try to always have at least someone from our environmental services program there with information on things like our spill response programs and, and our other programs. So, yeah, we're getting it back up to speed after COVID, but those are those are some of our our main avenues. All right, thank you, Courtney, Jennifer. Anything that you want to mention to the audience about community outreach that you're doing as part of your work? Go go ahead, Jen. All right, um, sure. We do um, reach out to the community. Um, we do some face-to-face -face outreach at powwow and also at our boat launches. And that's where we hand out some of those um, spill kits. And um, we've done a presentation at our general tribal council meeting, which is um, invite, it's, it's for where the whole community is in, invited. And it's an, these are important meetings because a lot of policy is passed at these. So we have presented at that and we do social media posts too. Okay, and go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, just just to add on to, yeah, to all of that, um, we have a, a monthly newsletter that goes out and um, each 
each department, you know, usually has a page. And so I try to get something out regarding our program um, every month. I mean, it is not always emergency response or the Brownfield program, it, you know, can be water quality or, or something else. But um, I try and get something out there in that. Um, and then our our natural resources department hosts its own, um, we call it the Fair and Feast, but it's a an event that we host each year in September. And so we were able to get some education awareness out during that too, so. That's a good community outreach going on, it sounds like for all of your communities. Trying, yeah. Yeah. Yep, trying and then all, yep, and always trying to do more, so. Um, okay, so we have, um, a, a few more questions. And so um, I will, I'll ask, uh, we have a three part question. So I'm going to just start with the first one. And, and it is to what extent do you make use of CERT, C-E-R-T teams in your response uh, planning and, and your response to emergencies? Uh, Traven, do you want to take that one first? Um. Sure. So I had to double check uh, what the CERT acronym actually meant, but it looks like Community Emergency Response Team. To, to be completely honest, I haven't done a lot of work with Community Emergency Response Teams. Uh, I don't know if, you know, some of the work that we've done through the Northern Michigan Area Committee or the Regional Response Team 5 uh, would be technically considered under that, you know, program or not. But, um, and I'm looking at just my phone here and seeing pictures of 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 CERT teams. I'm, I don't recall even being on any of the incidents that I've been on and seeing the CERT vests or, or hard hats that I'm seeing in, in these pictures. So, Maybe that's something that I need to look a little bit more into and get more educated about. <laughs> yeah, no worries, Traven. Um, that is, how about I'll have you just stay um, stay up next for the next question. And the next question really has to do about what challenges you experience in coordinating planning and response efforts with other response groups. And so maybe I'll have you just uh, take that one, and then we can go to uh, Jennifer, then Courtney. So challenges in coordinating planning and response efforts. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that we probably all share some of the same challenges in terms of, you know, communication. Uh, a lot of times, historically and still to this very day, tribes are uh, left out of conversations that they need to be a part of. They're kind of treated as like, you know, an afterthought. Uh, I've seen huge improvements in this in organizations that, you know, I've worked with over the years. So that's really great news. But, you know, there are still times when something gets to us kind of last, or we have to hear about something through the news instead of getting a call from somebody. Uh, I think that that is a very common, you know, communication, you know, kind of basic respect kind of issue that we run into. Um, other issues I would, or challenges I would say is um, sometimes overlapping of agencies and their roles in different responses. It's still sometimes difficult to understand exactly who should be the incident commander, whether it be U.S. Coast Guard or EPA. You know, where does the state come in? Um, you know, everyone's got their own incident management, you know, booklet that they're operating off of. And those aren't always, you know, exactly the same type of frameworks. So I would say that that's kind of a challenge that we've that we've noticed as well. Those are those are just two of the big ones I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, um, Jennifer, anything you want to add to uh, Traven's, you know, challenges that he just mentioned? Uh, Traven covered a lot of it, but I would also say um, just because we are very young in our planning, a lot of our challenges are internal. Like when I had the response um, with the sinking or the submerged vessel. Um, uh, it, it's, it's like uh, the, the rest of the folks, like our, some of our other first responders were, were not really available. Um, there were other areas. So that was a big learning 
curve for me. Like I didn't have the cell number of our police chief or our conservation um, department chief. So um, we're still definitely learning. And I think because we're really young in our planning process, um, you know, a lot of those things will be worked out. Yeah. Uh, Courtney, anything that you would like to add with respect to uh, challenges that you may face with um, planning and response efforts? Yeah, <clears throat> so mimicking what um, both Jen and Traven said, um, and yeah, and then adding our, our program seems lately seems to have had a, a decent amount of turnover um, and, and some other programs in our tribal government have as well. And so yeah, I think it's just like what Jen was saying, like on top of what they've, they said, everything else, but just like keeping track of who is who and, and phone numbers and then keeping trainings up and um, just to, yeah, making sure staff is, is on up, up to par with everything as well, so. All right, thank you. The The last of this three-part question is, you all mentioned uh, facilities that uh, pose potential hazards, whether it's gas stations or marinas. Um, so when it comes to the owners and operators of those facilities that you mentioned, what challenges um, have you experienced in coordinating above and beyond the challenges that you've just mentioned? And I'm just going to toss this out for any of the three of you who want to answer this question about um, difficulties, challenges, and coordinating with the actual owner operators of these facilities. I guess I, since I've kind of been going first, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go first again here. I, um, not to get, you know, too political with it, but I think that a lot of times we're running into issues, you know, with just like the profit motive, you know, a lot of these, um, owners and operators or, uh, uh or corporations, they're, you know, they're still worried about their baseline, um, and, and their profits, um, unfortunately, sometimes they put that above anything else. So I think that when we're working with these companies that are trying to save as much money as possible, um, that, that can be, that, that can be a, a serious challenge. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna uh, then go to our uh, one of our next questions and and that is uh, whether there are any new or additional tools or research that would help tribes be better prepared to um, respond to or plan uh, to respond to spills in in the regions where your communities are based and and maybe I'll turn it to Jennifer first. Um, yeah, so interest in tools research. Um, so the Center for Freshwater Research and Education has this great new um, facility that's a part of it, which um, I was just about to Google it because I can't remember <laughs> it, but I know that they're looking at um, how to respond and handle um, spills in freshwater. So unfortunately, I cannot remember the name of that entity right now. It's, it's part of... Um, the Coast Guard, and they're yeah. doing a lot of great work related to that, and also um, spills with really in, in icy areas, which is also a real challenge. Great Lakes Oil Spill Center of Expertise, I think, is what you you might be thinking about. Yes, thank yes. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Courtney, anything you want to add? Uh, additional tools or research that might help you better prepare for or respond to spills. Um, I was just, it kind of touches on the, the icy yeah. conditions question too, but I was, it didn't end up actually end up happening, but um, there was going to be an icy uh, sp like spill training at the no spills conference um, earlier this year, but we didn't have any ice up here <laughs> at the time. So we couldn't have it. Um, but so whenever that comes back around, I think that will be awesome um, to be, a, to be a part of. And then um I think, I mean, there are so many tools out there. It's just being able to sit down and figure out how to use them and, you know, properly and get staff trained up on them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Having the time to, to be able to invest in that. Um, 
Yeah. So, um, Traven, I'll have you um, also answer the question about whether there are any new tools or research that might be needed that might help you. Um, I think those my other presenters hit on a lot of it. I, I definitely want to echo Courtney's, um, you know, comments about working on icy conditions that was a huge limiting factor when uh, we were responding to the ATC cable incident um so yeah definitely that type of stuff i've i've been really fortunate to uh, be able to attend a lot of the you know full scale exercises and things like that and see some of the new up and coming technologies like the remote operated you know, ski dudes that can tow boom and like cannons that can launch, um, you know, th the thing ropes for the boom to be towed across places instead of having to like physically bring it there. You know, a lot of these uh, drone systems in order to help us, uh, in order to help us, you know, get a aerial view of spills and, and trajectories. I always appreciate, you know, the role that NOAA in National Oceanic atmospheric administrations um uh, i always appreciate their role in in um modeling and trajectories and and weather reports when it comes to responses so yeah i think that the spill response community has a lot of technological advances um in in the past five years and going into the future that are going to be really um really pivotal okay great yeah so it sounds like um potential, hopeful um, ice oil res spill response exercise on ice uh, would be really helpful um, for all of you as well as um, probably many in the spill response community. So with that, we are running short on time and I'm gonna have Mark wrap it up for us. Thanks, Kelsey. I just wanna sincerely thank all of our three panelists, uh, Courtney Hessel, Traven Michaels and Jennifer Satchel for their presentations today on uh, giving us an introduction to tribal sp spill response programs. This is a great finish to our uh, 2023 webinar series. And thanks to all of you as webinar participants. Please do check out our website where you'll find a, a treasure trove of archived webinars and other information on a variety of topics related to hazardous material transportation risk. And have a great day. So thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.